Kiki Koto, Kua Tai Mai Nei Te Tēnei Te Tangi. Ko Tēnei Te Mihi Ki Ngā Tangata Whenua o Te Motu. Ko, sorry, Tēnā Koto e Ngā Kai Kōrero. Haere mai ki te Whakifiti Whiti Kōrero. Ngā Mihi Nui Ki Ngā Tangata Kua Whakanui i te Kaukapa o te rā nei. Kia ora. Ko Avril Bella ho, he pakiha aho no kaitaia. Um, it's really wonderful to have so many people here and around the Motu uh, for us to join us on this um, occasion. Uh, and I especially like to, you know, thank everyone for being here, and especially our three speakers who've made the time to be here and talk on this really important kaitaia. Um, I'm really excited to hear the conversation, I have to say. So I've, I've been waiting in nervous anticipation for the last week, I'd say. Um, my name is Avril Bell. I teach in sociology here at the University of Auckland. And um, I run this seminar series with my colleagues, who one of who's in the room with me is Fitzpatrick and Trudy Kane from Massey University, who I can see on the screen. Mm. Sorry, I keep looking that way because the screen mm. that I can see everybody yeah, on is up that way. I should be looking at this view when I speak. Um, in a moment, I'm going to pass over to Lena to uh, do a karakia for us, and then I'll ask the panel to introduce themselves, and then we'll get started on the conversation. It's going to be a conversation in response to a short set of questions uh, that I will pose to the panel around our two themes of Māori in local government and Māori and local government, which are two quite distinct sets of issues. Uh, hopefully we'll get some time for each of the questions. We'll just see how we go because we only have, you know, an hour and a quarter-ish, I guess. Um, please mute your microphones if you haven't done that already because we, we're recording this and that will really help with the sound quality. Um, and if people have questions as we go through the discussion, you're really welcome to use the chat function in Zoom to type those questions in. And if we have time at the end, we will field as many questions as we can. Okay. No reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Tēnā koutou katoa. Kei noi tātou, tū taua mai i raro, tū taua mai i roto, tū taua mai i waho, kia tau ai te mauri tū, te mauri ora, ki te katoa. Hau mi e, hui e, tāna ki e. So, um, introduction, it's a chance to introduce yourself and start early. Okay. Tēnā koutou katoa, ko tainui me te aroa ku waka, ko Ngāti Pike o Ngāti Rārua, Ngāti Manyapoto te iwi, ko Kapatu i tōku marae, ko Waipa tōku awa, ko Brandy Stafford, Hudson, aho. Kia ora koutou. Tēnā koutou katoa, e mihi ana ki a koe e aiho, nga i karanga ki a mātou ki a Kia whare mai ki te kōrero e pāna ki te kaupapa i nui a tātou. Ko Ngāpui me te rāroa, me Ngāti Hine, uku iwa i hapu rānei. Ko Lina Hine tōku ingoa, he mihi poto i ngari, he mihi nui ki a kaupai. Kia ora. Maria. Kia ora, tēnā koutou katoa, tēnā koe Avril, te kaiwhakahaere o tēnei tuihuinga, tēnā kōrua Brandy, Lena, kei te mihi, huri noa kia tātou katoa, tēnā rā koutou, kia ora everybody, ko Maria Barge tōku ingoa, nō te aroa me ngā te awa ahau. Kia ora koutou. I can see so many faces, I'm so <laughs> dazzled. I know, so many faces, but there's many of them are tiny little dots in the distance, which is a little bit disconcerting, but never mind. The sound is good, so that's really good. And we definitely make an exception in terms of the muting for you, Maria. You can just keep your, I think if you keep your microphone on, that will be okay. easy for you and it probably will be fine. Yeah. Okay, so... I won't waste any more time. I thought I'd just get started straight away. And in fact, I thought I'd start with you, Maria, in terms of the first question. Like, we, if we take the, the theme of Māori within local government as the first, as a starting point, um, 
why is it important that we have structural mechanisms to ensure Māori representation within local bodies? Mm. Well, I have a fairly short answer to this question, actually, and I'm looking forward to, um, to more discussion. Um, but I guess to get to the real heart of the matter, um, my answer would be because of the treaty guarantees. And, um, you know, we were guaranteed, or at least our tenoranga tiratanga was reaffirmed um, in the treaty. I know because it's been pointed out to me that the treaty didn't say there shall be seven Māori seats in central government and there shall be Māori wards and constituencies. But the treaty did say that our tenoranga tiratanga was reaffirmed and that gives rise to these political rights um, for us and the need for Māori representation. So that's the first point. And I guess the second one is the Treaty of Waitangi also gave rise to obligations for the Crown. Um, so they have a duty to actively protect uh, Māori political rights, our citizenship rights, uh, and that includes our rights to representation at a local government um, Level. So I think there are two, those two parts that are fundamentally at the heart of it and those are the two that actually I always go back to um, and I think that it helps to avoid some of the um, red hearings and um, some of the kind of misinformation that I think is actively put out by groups in, in a very um, sort of nasty way. Um, so I think those two points, our treaty rights and the Crown's obligation to actively protect our political rights are the two, yeah. two points at the heart of it. Mm. Great, thanks. But I thought we wouldn't give too much airtime to those nasty negative groups today. We'll spend our energy on the, uh, on the more positive and constructive kind of conversation. Would uh, either of you want to add anything to that in terms of those? I oh, totally agree with what um, Maria has, has already presented and gets the practical effect that it will give to this treaty uh, relationship and the treaty obligation. Um, and we need structural mechanisms because of the nature of local government. It's a creature of statute and uh, without statute it wouldn't um, actually it wouldn't have local government. So primarily, I'm not sure. Um, Kia ora, Tracy. Yes, we, uh, we're just talking because there's a whole lot of other people on another number. Ah. Can uh, you so the one that we were sent to, there's three others, and I'm just telling them that what, your, what this ID is, it's not the ID we were sent. Okay. Can <laughs> so you just unmute just your microphone? We're just telling them on the other one, and we're going to connect to your, this one on the big screen. Okay, and can you con mute your microphones in the, in the between times? I think that's uh, causing a little bit of a problem. We'll just keep going. Thank you. Oh, well, okay. Sorry. So what I, was sort of, um, yeah, I don't know what you were saying. So, <laughs> just picking up about having re Māori representation really giving practical effect to uh, the treaty obligations that Crown have, but also uh, the, the nature of local government is, is that it's a creature of statute. So that's why we actually need Crown to, act, uh, to provide for these treaty obligations. And really to respond to a history of requests, applications <laughs> by Māori. Um, we know that here in Tāmaki that um, when we see submissions made to Auckland Council and previous councils within the Rohe of Ngāti Whātu or Rākei, they always quote um, Paura Tu Haere, who back in the 19th century Asked that um, Māori be given a seat, or oh, not a seat, that let, let Māori be part of the council. So mm -hmm. I would say that every iwi hapu have their own desire about what that might look like, but we know that there are numerous historical um, you know, references around wanting to have tribal, continue tribal authority and decision making within their own body. So um, I, I agree. Kia ora, Maria. I love to see you. Tracy's there somewhere. So nice to have girlfriends on the screen. Um, looks like there's most girlfriends out there. The rest of us. And then there's Dan, of course, my whanaunga. Um, so uh, just as far as um, structural mechanisms are concerned, I think that uh, because we're a minority uh, culture in, in Aotearoa, without the structural mechanism, we haven't got a hope of hell. Uh, of getting the majority to do uh, things in the way that we want them to do and the speed that we want them to do. So 
that's a, a really important reason to have a structural mechanism in the statute um, when you're a minority group. And especially when you're a minority group where 50% of your population of Māori are under 25 years old. And, uh, and many of us, I think as many as 80% of us have, are living in poverty. I'm mm. not sure if that, I'm guessing what that number is from what I just know to be what I see in Auckland, Tamaki Makoto. Uh, and uh, just the, the, the troubles that we face just trying to just live in our different perspective of communities mm. um, and then the few people that are left, few mighty people that are left to be on the many boards and to have the many relationships with central and local government. We're so thinly spread. I was just talking today about some of our mighty governors being on 18 boards. Mm. You know, this is just ridiculous. So these structural mechanisms for me are like navigators and that they're waka that we can get onto where we feel some hope and um, we feel our sense of tanga in, in, in my mind. Kia ora. Okay. Thank you. So I thought we'll carry on with you, Brandy, for the um, the next question, which is around the current options that are on the table. And I, I know there are quite a few people from Auckland Council that are participating in this. We've probably got a lot of knowledge about the options, but there will also be people <coughs> in the audience who probably don't have much knowledge about what the kind of, you know, current frameworks uh, and, and different kind of councils around the more to, um, you know, how they operate. So, yeah, what, I'd be interested to get an overview of what the current options are and if you think there's any other alternatives that we should also be considering. Do you need to be in this room? Me? Yeah. No, I'm quite comfortable outside. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Does anybody want me? <laughs> uh, so, we, so the question is what do you see as the pros and cons of the current options? So I'm the CEO of the Independent Mighty Statutory Board and uh, we, be, we became the board when the Super City came into action in November 2010. So prior to that, uh, Māori marched to get two seats on the new Auckland Council. And that was rejected, but they did agree at some ungodly hour of the night um, that they would uh, have this independent Māori statutory board. And um, I know that our chairperson always thanks um, the chap from ACT, who's that? Rodney Hyde. Rodney Hyde. Thanks him so much because I don't think it's on his mind. <laughs> he realised um, what um, what he was getting, what he was agreeing to, <laughs> and, um, and he famously wrote in I think Mike Chen's book that um, when he was asked what was one of the worst things he'd ever done, and that was put the Independent Mighty Statutory Board into uh, in, into the system. So. Um, I guess when the board was formed back in 2010 and uh, we just had no idea of what we were going to do and what one year looked like as, a, as opposed to 10 years. And uh, one of the things we did was we really looked at the four words, independent of everyone, including Māori. We are uh, the Māori statutory board, so we're not the Pacific Island statutory board, we're not the Chinese statutory board, we are only here to represent uh, the views of Māori in Tāmaki Makaurau. Statute meant that um, if you didn't, uh, didn't listen to us, that we had some, um, some opportunity to talk legally to you and really upset your day by threatening court action. So um, that, was, that was great for us to have the word statutory in our name. And then there was the word board. So the board meant that we needed to be resourced and the board has nine members on it. And so those nine members were also given a secretariat of which I lead so when we went in to try and get funding for the board, we made sure that it was parallel to any other board um, that the council had set up, and namely the local boards. So when they told us that they would give us $300,000 and just per annum and go knock yourself out, we told them to get lost. John Tamahiri did a big haka, and at the finance and performance meeting, it went through the papers, it was ugly, and we walked out with $3 million a year to run the board. So that was the power of those four words, independent Māori statutory board. And for the first two years, David Taipati was insistent as a chairman that no one would refer to us as an advisory board because he considered that advisory boards um, had been abused around the country. No matter what Māori advisory board, the views weren't taken into account when it came to funding, when it came to resources, when it came to trying to understand how they could do things in a bicultural way. 
um, so he uh, was very upset when anybody used the word advisory. So we, and he also tried to make me and the staff uh, not call us the IMSB, the acronym, but to call us the Independent Māori Statutory Board, so that those four words would sink into the hearts and minds of the people we had to work with. So um, that was one of the first um, the beginnings of me being the most unpopular Māori woman in Auckland, but I don't really <laughs> that. Um, when I see the options in the Independent Māori Statutory Board, um, we also, in about year two, thought that uh, we had done a great service for Māori seats because up until the Independent Māori Statutory Board, Māori seats were not supported mostly around the country. And then as soon as they saw the power of our board, they were like quickly agreeing with Māori seats being quite a good option. <laughs> so um, so that was that was an interesting development and a change of, um, of part, I think, out in, out in the provinces towards uh, Māori seats. And we're not, we're still a, st still a long way from getting people to... Um, to agree to Māori seats, and we've got to change the dreadful legislation, the racist legislation, in my mind, to ensure that Māori seats seats are definitely an option for those regions that um, for all of all of the regions of Aotearoa. Mm -hmm. We believe that there should be seats and an independent Māori state board. Uh, we think for each region, and we think this because um, those seats are often very lonely. The people in them, mm -hmm. um, they just become part of the big. Um, council machine. They don't have dedicated um, specialist people to help them navigate through the many um, services, facilities, regulations and advocacy that councils have to do around the motu. So uh, because we have a big budget and we have many staff, our board members are briefed and are given expert advice on how to be advocates at the council table where they are, minor I am a, are a minority. So what we realised was that our two votes on the council committees that we are on, which are most of them, and especially the powerful um, committees of um, finance, etc., is that we were the swing votes. So we use our votes in a politically astute way where we are the advocates and we side up with the mayor um, and we make sure that the mayor is very aware of our views and we use them to be, essentially, the words have been used, the kingmaker. And um, there's been many um, decisions where the council has had to rely on our two votes. So we knew we had to be very smart um, with using our two votes. Uh, I see uh, that there's other options around the motu. There's one in Te Arawa, and maybe Maria knows more than that option about that option than I do. Uh, there's the body seats on the Bay of Plenty Regional Council. And um, then there's some statutory powers that give different types of um, uh, leadership opportunities around them. I don't know those particularly well. I see that um, uh, in 2018, having an independent Māori statutory board is just part of our evolution as a nation. And I um, gen you know, genuinely hope that my children and my grandchildren uh, won't be talking about Māori representation in the same way, way that we are, mm -hmm. uh, that things have evolved um, to where we really see the Treaty of Waitangi um, uh, being manifesting in our communities to show real partnership. And at the end of the day, we, um, are, we totally believe that Māori values and um, our worldview is of benefit to all peoples of Aotearoa and around the world. We don't do things by Māori for Māori. Um, only we are by Māori for everyone. So if you own, to only look at our cultural, social, economic and environmental values and our aspirations, these benefit everyone. They make absolute total sense um, mm -hmm. in what we aspire for our country to be. And that's clean, that's green, that's connected, that's vibrant, um, that's well-educated, that's healthy. So the sooner um, you know, non-Māori non, non non organisations um, take a really good look at um, the advice that Māori offer and then put it into practice, the better off Aotearoa will be. Kia ora. Marina, do you think you've analysed the situation quite well? <laughs> <laughs> By the great fatigue. <laughs> um, the, the only other thing I'd want to add is uh, um, that these, some of these options have been around since 2002 with the Local Government Act, and yet they've never been picked up. Mm -hmm. And it has been, I believe, uh, from the establishment of the Independent Māori Statutory Board that we have institutions that have not supported Māori representation in the past and local government reforms. 
um, for Māori to have actually dedicated seats and a voice at the government's table. Um, there's also other council options around uh, establishing Māori advisory boards, which was something that was practiced in the, in the 80s through to the 90s and uh, didn't serve us well. Um, and then you have councils that say it's a community of interest, but we go back to what Maria said around the, the, the treaty obligations, and none of them are the fishing of, of a treaty partnership, a, a treaty relationship, mm. a treaty-based um, you know, rep representation uh, model. So mm. there's probably lots of cons. Yeah, lots of cons. <laughs> Not so many it's pros in the current your, model. <laughs> In terms of the, um, like you say, the racist legislation, right? The fact that there's the um, option to set up Māori seats or wards. I'm not too sure about the terminology, but that that's the only option in the local government act where it can be overturned by a citizen. Mm. Citizens well, referendum. The that's, actually, that's not under the local government act. Yeah, right. They, they, that's a separate piece of legislation, and I, I guess it also is needing to respond to treaty settlements. Mm. and the recognition of, of those grievances, but also the um, the economic power that um, Iwi and Hapu are gaining, and also the, 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 um, the willingness to at least have a discussion about the Tangata. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Maria, you might have something that you want to add just in general on that question, but you might also have a response to Brandy's suggestion as the ideal scenario of everybody having an independent Māori statutory board and Māori seats, which sounds pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, right. I do have some things to, to add. <laughs> I mean, I agree um, with the kinds of pros and cons that have been discussed. Um, it's a pro to have some guaranteed seats, but the con, of course, is if you're a lonely one or even lonely two sitting around a council table, you're quite easily outvoted. And if you do have the power to be that kind of kingmaker position and ha be the swing vote, then that's that's useful. But most mostly, you're probably going to be voted outvoted. Mm -hmm. um, so I do think that having an independent Māori statutory board structure um, with the backup of the secretariat is completely crucial for really the kind of proper expression of a Māori voice um, representing a Māori constituency. Um, I guess um, uh, I guess the interesting side of that though that's not talked about as much is that um, you know what difference would it make if those representatives um, on the independent Māori statutory board were elected um, as opposed to selected in by mana whenua and I think there are a whole lot of um, conversations actually about the distinctions um, between being mana whenua in particular areas and being ma tawaka and we know there are and this is probably a, a conversation for um, Māori, hapu and iwi um, to have, first of all, I'd imagine, um, around the different, um, the different rights that mana, mana whenua have. And they do have different rights in their mana whenua areas, and that has to be respected by other Māori people who are just living in those areas and are guests in those areas. Um, the Te Arawa model or the Te Arawa partnership model, I think, is quite interesting. It's quite different from the Independent Māori Statutory Board. It doesn't have its own legislation. In part, it was um, encouraged by the Rotorua District Council, um, but the Te Arua Lakes Trust was, was kind of central as part of the conversation. They have 14 representatives, because in Te Arua, you know, we couldn't possibly have nine <laughs> for just our, you know, a huge population in Rotorua. Um, so there are 14 representatives. Um, but what is quite interesting, they are then defined. Um, so there are, there's one koeke representative, so someone specifically to be the voice of um, um, Kaumatua, Kuia Karaua, um, two rangatahi reps, so, you know, a specific voice for younger people, um, there's two representatives for Ngāti Whakaue, um, and part of that is historical in the sense that 
they were the main group that gave the main part of the Rotorua township, the land there. Um, there are six other representatives representing other hapu of Te Arawa, so we've all got to squeeze into there. <laughs> and then there are two um, representatives for Māori Land Trusts and Incorporations, and again, that's quite a unique um, kind of framework to have land trusts and incorporations having their own specific representatives. And then there's another representative for um, pan Tiarua, um entities. So it's, it's, it's quite a different way of approaching representation. So it's a, a voice for Tiarua, but then within Tiarua, there are kind of these distinctions that are, are drawn up, um, which I think is quite um, innovative um, and wouldn't of course suit all um, hapu and iwi but is something that has um, gone ahead there. Um, again those representatives are all elected and the Te Arua Lakes Trust's uh, membership list was used as the sort of inaugural um, electoral role um, which again is a, is a little bit odd I think um, uh, but they were the ones that had the most up-to-date up to uh, membership register of Te Arua people. Um, and so I, that's why I understand that they were used. Where it goes in the next few years, it'll be interesting to see. Um, I'm not sure that they had the same um, power when it came to bargaining for uh, funding for a secretariat that um, Brandy managed to wield <laughs> in Auckland. And that's one of the... Um, challenges for the Tarawa Partnership Board is, is trying to get um, to build capacity to really support the two representatives that sit on two different committees um, within the council itself. But having that kind of um, secretariat, people who can be writing advice and policy is crucial. I think Brandy's absolutely right on that. It's crucial to have that backbone of support for Māori representatives um, in those areas. Um, but I do wonder how different it would look if they were elected representatives um, rather than um, a selected by a mana whenua forum as they are in Auckland. Mm. That's a good point that you raised because initially uh, with the amalgamation of councils across Auckland, the Royal Commission uh, had recommended that there be two seats at the governance level as well as a mana whenua board and trying to acknowledge you know, uh, elections as well as the interests of mana whenua. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's some, something there in terms of with our current options having uh, elections for representative uh, representative Māori voice, voices as well as uh, the um, secretariat model mm -hmm. of supporting mana whenua to make those changes. And, yeah, that's. Um, do you want to chip in on that issue of election and selection? Yes. Yeah, so, just in regards to election, I mean, um, we know now that no matter um, whether it's local, central government, Māori uh, are not um, you know, utilising their vote, and I guess that's because we feel like we are. Our vote doesn't count. We um, we don't have. Um, many of us don't have uh, that. Uh, willingness to go and vote because we usually don't identify with anybody that's available <laughs> to be elected. So, uh, so, so just in our in our behaviour, um, elections are, are difficult for us in this time. And I hope that um, our kids are going to change the, and increase the numbers of Māori that do in the future vote. So this is all part of the journey to improving where we are now. So if, if there was elections of, uh, say, for people onto the statutory board, you know, I just wonder, given our behaviour to this date, how that, how that would pan out and then what type of communications and education needs to happen to ensure that we actually um, utilise the process. So um, that's my only comment about the, 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 just the challenge for elections. Mm -hmm. We like selections. They get paid to come to the meeting. So that's a first you know, motivation for them to be part of the selection body. They know that they're going to be respected and valued. Their time is going to be respected and valued. They know that they're going to be um, treated. The leaders know they're going to be treated with the regard. Um, they know that um, but because the board has had some um, big cut-throughs around the policy and the planning of um, Auckland Council, that's important to come to the selection process. So and from my observation of it, and I've, I've, I've seen three now, They've been very respectful of the selection process. 
And uh, yeah, it may not be selection forever, but I think it's been a very first uh, good step towards um, towards where hopefully election will kick into the future generations. So the impact of uh, the independent Māori tax people is not just the yeah, the table. There's actually other statutory uh, responsibilities and authority that the um, the board has, such as being able to audit. Um, the council in terms of its obligations to the treaty are well within the legislative framework and ensuring that those are ca um, carried out and the opportunity to talk about the schedule of um, issues of significance. So matters that contribute to Māori wellbeing are tabled at the um, council. So there's the there's all of that other stuff that goes alongside yeah, yeah. Māori representation um, at the government yeah, right. we, We'd like to see the treaty audit um, uh, spread around the country. We've had different approaches from other councils, regional and district, to have a look at our treaty audit, and it's basically scared the Jesus out of them, and so they haven't done it. Um, that's the truth. Because uh, what we did was we set up a legislative framework. We got our lawyers to do that. Um, the council then passed it over to their legal experts and they finalised a legal framework. And so rather than um, just talking to them generally about our aspirations, we spoke specifically to their statutory obligations to Māori, including the Treaty of Waitangi. So that gave us a very powerful conversation with them. What we knew when we did the first treaty audit with them, we, we got all the statutes and we said, we're going to audit you against this. And we knew that the council would significantly fail the audit. But um, what we decided at the time was rather than focusing on the significant failure, we'd simply take it as a baseline and work positively together to hope and to hope that um, to help the council uh, fix their um, their um, negligence uh, and not threaten to take them to court for um, their negligence around statute, but to work it in a best practice way towards giving. Um, the op optimising um, the law that, um, that um, helped with partnership and showed um, the value of Māori culture to uh, this your here in Aotearoa. So um, we did the first audit, they significantly failed. Uh, and then they did the second audit, we did the second audit on them three years later and they failed significantly again. But uh, what Len Brown said at the time was, although we've continued to have significant failure, our attitude has changed. So we actually really supported what Len said at the time, Mayor Brown said at the time, because he was right. So what that failure really uh, clarified was the lack of education, and this is where I have a really big bugbear with two, three secondary primary schools, um, and that uh, the the people that work in these councils are not educated, whether they're engineers, architects, planners, um, they're specialists in resource consent, that it's not a compulsory part of their of their um, their their qualification to have competency, their cultural competency um, and to be able to have cultural competency in their specialist area. So tertiary institutions have a major responsibility for what you see in local government into the future. So um, that's, I'll talk a little bit about that later on. We need a treaty order here, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe we should, we should be do. getting you to come and do a treaty order. Yes, we have suggested that too. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're doing our best, Brandy. <laughs> um, thank you all for that. That's really amazing to be in a position where we might thank Rodney Hyde for anything, eh? <laughs> <laughs> oh, and really interesting, um, Maria, to hear about because one thing that immediately makes me think about is that obviously the, so the model is going to have to be different everywhere, right? So whatever, everybody's different councils, different iwi, hapu regions uh, have different kinds of issues or different relation, mixes of relationships that they need to be mindful of. So um, it would be nice to have the flexibility so that there can be a lot of self-determination the relevant iwi around this can we ever get to move towards having these things. Um, okay, we're going to move on to talk about uh, the issue of Māori and local government, which is moving away from talking about the, the um, way that Māori should be involved and partners and participating in 
local government structures per se, to looking more at how local government engages with Māori in the community. And I think in particularly, well not particularly now because of treaty settlements, it should always been the truth and the, the reality that um, local government have or should have had a responsibility to engage with their uh, local iwi and hapu, because that's their job. Um, but now we are in the treaty settlement era. I think it sort of annoys me that maybe they're going to start paying attention because some of the iwi are getting wealthy enough for them to take notice of. They should just pay attention by right, but anyway, by, you know, responsibility. Anyway, sorry, I shouldn't be raving on too much. My, the first question around that was, um, what is it that, if, you know, uh, that is unique about Māori communities that means that they are um, and should be important partners for local bodies? And I think, Brandy, you've already kind of touched on one element of this, but Lena, I was going to start with you on that. Um, yeah. Well, uh, I think the significant thing in terms of experience of watching and observing uh, changes that have occurred is that um, Māori aren't trying to be unique, but just in being um, ourselves from a Māori worldview and all the values that come with that, um, we can see that it has changed, changed the way that uh, people think about the environment. As a planner, urban planner, um, can see that uh, it offsets some of the decisions that are primarily around it efficiency and effectiveness, which is really around costs and benefits mm -hmm. and primarily around economics of uh, doing uh, making a decision about doing something or not. Um, so Māori provide a longer term view of both the past and the future of what the possibilities could be. Um, so we have, uh, we can contribute to the community's decisions around the option by just having a, a broader perspective um, and then even sharing the stories and we hear now it's, it's common, becoming a common practice to talk about daylighting streams instead of piping streams and to talk about our environment in a way that small changes with, um, including native trees um, in our streetscape etc. We just saw this morning with um, articles around um, asthma and um, yeah. you know issues of that people who um, are raised in or children who are raised in rural areas um, they're, they're lower uh, they're more resistant to those yeah. types of illnesses uh, so you know those our environment is is, is primary and um, I think mana whenua in particular have have that role to be able to help with those decisions that are made and um, also around issues of um, equality, and uh, in particular around poverty, that you know the issue that we talk about today, and, and housing, etc. Um, Māori are part of those statistics that we talk about, so have a lived experience and have solutions that are innovative and. Um, sometimes co-opted by political parties, etc. Mm -hmm. but it doesn't matter, there's the, the Māori can provide solutions to these issues that local government make decisions about. Mm -hmm. cool. Maria, would you like to have some say? Yeah, I mean, so your question was um, sort of what are the unique aspects that make them important partners. Well, I can't help but just going back to the treaty again. We're, we're treaty partners. We're tangata whenua. Um, so, you know, we're not going anywhere. Um, that's the sort of first thing. And clearly have strong and historical and cultural connections to those particular locations and the resources in those places. I guess also, um, importantly, we're landowners and farmers and, and so on. Um, but also have statutory acknowledgements. Many hapu and iwi, or iwi runanga at least, have statutory acknowledgements in particular areas, which mean that councils need to be paying attention um, to the rights and interests of those, those groups. Um, where there's dock lands, a lot of iwi will have memoranda of understandings about some sort of co-governance of those, um, those places and resources. So iwi are clearly 
a crucial uh, part of the kind of political, economic, social um, landscape in local areas um, and aren't going anywhere. So um, that seems uh, like a, a, a kind of <laughs> a basic point to me. <laughs> <clears throat> I think um, just when we talk about Unica, I, you know, I really want to acknowledge our resilience mm. and um, despite, you know, the really tragic things that um, – have happened to us due to colonisation and continue to happen to us despite our incarceration rates, our poor health, our bad um, education rates. We, can, we are constantly putting out information and having wānanga about our aspirations. Mm -hmm. And we are really focused on um, you know, improving the quality of each generation. Um, we are committed to being on this whenua forever. We speak in... Um, and as, as, as Lena said, our, we speak in our history of the parting of Papa Tuanuku and, and Rangi. Uh, you know, we talk about um, our, you know, our gods of the, of the moana, of the forests. Um, and we, these are the things that have, I believe, continue to make us resilient because we have these kaitiaki, we have this history, and we have this hope for the future that is um, you know, quite exceptional. And you know, when I look at indigenous cultures right around the world, having done a bit of work with um, some of them, we are even more unique in that we've got this little tiny land. We're not spread across like America where there's many um, um, native people out there that have got so, just so, are so few and far between across this big land mass. We're, we're quite tight in here. And I had the pleasure of going to the Māori Business Awards on Friday night. And when I think of what those business awards were when they first started and what they are now and just seeing, um, you know, our... Um, our determination um, to, to rise no matter what we face. I feel that's a very unique aspect um, that, you know, all of New Zealand can leverage off. And I also feel that our, um, our, our, our history, our cultural values, our waiata, our karakia have become, uh, are respected and revered by many people now. It's become an acceptable um, practice and we see it at the rugby, we see Indigenous peoples in, in Australia, um, you know, talking about um, their place and their whenua. So, you know, I'd like to think that um, Māori have led the way on those type of practices and helped other Indigenous cultures around the world to, um, you know, rebuild themselves and to have hope into the future. So, you know, I think that our, the quality of things that Māori have to offer is huge for all of us. Um, okay, thank you. So uh, it's kind of, you know, when I listen to you all saying all those things, it seems like no-brainers, you know, it seems so obvious. And so it, it's kind of intriguing to think what is it that, that it gets in the way of our local body politicians um, and grasping some of these things, I guess, and, um, and or, or, or do they? understand that and I guess there's probably a yes and a no answer there's probably some that do and some that don't but if you know do they understand it and what gets in the way of them understanding the value of engaging with Māori communities if they, if they um yeah gets in the way of sorry I'm confusing myself I think I've I think I've got the question Maria knows. Haven't I? Maria yeah, knows. yeah. She's Maria, you can <laughs> Yeah, I think I'm responding to that first. Um, well, I think um, there's a, a couple of factors. Brandy's um, tried to blame the universities from not educating them properly. <laughs> but, but actually, uh, you know, when we talk to the students in our classes, I teach Māori politics, and when I talk to the students there, they're often saying that, you know, um, they didn't learn a lot about New Zealand history or Māori political history or Māori history at high school either. Um, so there's some of that education that needs to go on at schools. Basic New Zealand history, what happened, not just there was a treaty and there were three articles and let's move on, but actually the kind of contextual information about what was going on in the 1800s, what was going on in those times, and the Māori political institution, institutions that existed before that. Um, so I think that's all really kind of important for changing the way people think generally. Um, and I do think that um, on top of that, there's also um, a kind of dominant conversation that keeps 
re-emerging around democracy. And I think people also fail to understand that our democracy in New Zealand is unique and particular, um, different from liberal democracy elsewhere, um, because we have the Treaty of Waitangi. That shapes the way in which our democracy is manifested here and is primarily about uh, Māori, uh, the British Crown, the Crown, um, as part as the kind of two fundamental parties within this democracy and the way we set up. And so that changes when people talk about um, Māori rights as um, special treatment or undemocratic. I think they fundamentally need to, to come to grips with the particular and unique type of democracy that we have here. Um, and so I think that's, that's a challenge for some people who have a very fixed idea about what democracy is, what liberal democracy means, and don't take into account New Zealand history or New Zealand circumstances. I think one way in which that could be made clearer for local government is by amending the Local Government Act and putting it quite clearly in, have a clause that quite clearly states something about uh, the Treaty of Waitangi, a Treaty of Waitangi clause within the Act, I think would make it fundamentally clearer. If you then had in conjunction a similar clause in the Local um, Electoral Act, um, around requiring Māori constituencies because of these treaty obligations that government, the Crown, local government have, then I think you could make that quite clear um, for local government. So the question is, what is your sense of whether local bodies understand this? You know, if you take the words local bodies out and said, what is your sense of whether New Zealanders understand this? then uh, I think we can have a better conversation because as soon as we start talking about local bodies, we think it's this, mm -hmm. uh, this thing mm -hmm. um, that is responsible for it. But it's the humans that go to work for these organisations and that um, want to be elected onto these organisations. They are New Zealanders. So I'm, you know, I'm looking at this question going, what is your sense of whether New Zealanders understand how to operationalise the Treaty of Waitangi in 2018 and beyond? And the simple answer is, some have some ideas, but most don't have any idea of how that really looks when they're talking about the operational um, um, aspects of a local government who has a long-term plan, that's the budget. If anyone can navigate them, work themselves through the local, the long-term plan, good luck to you. The district plans, the planning instruments, uh, the um, different type of transport instruments that drive these local bodies, they do not the instruments that make these local bodies work uh, do not speak strongly enough about what the Treaty of Waitangi uh, means in this contemporary context. So then when we try to encourage the council to go and get expert advice, there aren't actually many experts available to do the enormous amount of work in the specialist areas. And I'll just go back to engineering and infrastructure and architecture and planning to actually spread themselves around, not even around Auckland, let alone around the country. So often uh, people are talking about trying to raise the capacity of Māori. Well, I'm saying, well, no, we mm. need uh, you to raise the capacity of non-Māori for how Te Ao Māori looks today and beyond, mm -hmm. uh, you know, what, um, how you can give rise. I think that the words Treaty of Waitangi um, actually creates quite a bit of um, tension and um, negativity towards our advocacy because they keep on thinking that we're harping on about what happened back in, um, you know, the 1800s when we're really talking about our aspirations mm -hmm. into the future now, but that's not clear uh, to these people that work and govern local body organisations. And... Um, you know, I look at um, tertiary um, organise, uh, organisations as being enablers of that. And I don't believe that after all of the work that I've done at the statutory board, that the non-Māori are being educated in a way that mm. really is able to give change in these um, organisations that they then go on and work into. And then when I look back at secondary school, and I've given up trying to fight mine, I've just allowed them, my children, to not have anything Māori in their school, and just thought, well, I'll give it to them myself. And even at our primary school, just trying to get them to do karakia and going to the marae was, you know, this major um, task for them back in 2013. So once again, I know I'm part of a journey and I know that I have to do these things and persevere with um, the challenges and the hate mail and everything else that we get from <laughs> doing these sorts of jobs um, to see change into the future. Because, uh, you know, when I listen to my um, rangatira, my parents, um, you know, they are definitely looking to what we're doing now that benefits the next generation. So 
um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm calling on tertiary institutions to really um, look at your degree programs, your master's programs, and get them critiqued by the experts in your institutions that can give you some very good advice right in house about how these can be changed up to, um, to, um, to develop culturally competent um, operators uh, in, our, in, in our country. Mm -hmm. oh, uh, just really going back to those broader issues around the treaty and um, some of the uh, barriers about giving effect to what we're talking about um, and including Māori representation is, is the need to decolonise. Mm -hmm. um, and what I mean by that is that since 1852, with local government um, being established, there's not a lack of understanding. And even if we look back at um, discussions around the establishment of, of local authorities in Aotearoa, New Zealand, one of my tupuna, who was uh, General Willoughby Shortland, one of the Hotirini Fano, um, so on my Ngati Hini side, um, as well as other officials at the time, were well aware about the potential impact and implications that local government or local authorities would have. Uh, and they did talk about the option of establishing native districts mm -hmm. to provide for provide for Māori and to provide for the treaty, but it was a conscious decision mm -hmm. to not mm -hmm. have it back way back then. And we know that through Royal Commission um, inquiries, uh, submissions that have been made, it's not a lack of understanding. So to decolonise for me is to really uh, look at relinquishing power mm -hmm. and um, divesting the power that's currently um, uh, that currently exists. And we see that every time there is a discussion about uh, you know looking at um, Māori wards, that we see these old arguments uh, raise their heads again. Uh, mm -hmm. So. There is an issue around education. Um, so for our planning department, yeah, we have 60 uh, student enrolments every year, so it's limited to 60. And of those 60 students that enrol, we are lucky to get two Māori. And then for them to, for us to, uh, you know, be able to get them through the entire degree, we really have to wrap support around. So there's a, there's a, definitely a skills and knowledge gap um, around local government. But in saying that also, um, we need those structural changes because there are you know, individuals, like you said, humans, people uh, are making these decisions and developing policies, etc. And uh, there are some, there are, there, there are a lot of allies, there are a lot of people who are trying to work towards yes. um, some of the the, the, the goals that Māori have set mm -hmm. and, and, and to contribute to the well-being of Māori, um, but they're just not able to given the framework and the arrangements that we currently have. Mm -hmm. So the, that's why we, we need education as well as uh, uh, structural changes. Mm -hmm. Spoken like a true sociologist when you said that. That's really <laughs> you know, the, the individual or the personal and the structural. That's what, yeah. Well done. Well summarised. Um, so we, we're doing very well time-wise. So we're on to our final uh, question. So the people who are out there, who I can see there are some questions piling up, which is good. So we will have some time for those. But the final question that I had for the panel was around um, cases and um, places where things are working at least reasonably well in terms of councils and their relationships with Iwi and Hapu. Or if you can't think of places where they're working terribly well, but what would be required, do you think? Well, I suppose we've covered some of that in terms of education and structural change. Um, but yeah, so examples that you think there are things that are working quite well. So, Brandy. Well, I think that the Independent Statute, Independent Mind Statutory Board actually works really well with the council. And although we may not like um, each other's response to um, the different areas that we are working on together, uh, I just see that as just being part of um, you know, the evolving partnership between Māori and, um, and, and local government. 
New Zealanders and local government. And um, uh, and I and I also think that um, if you can set yourself a program, and that's what we did really, really um, well in the first in our first year, is that we had the treaty audit and the and the um, legal uh, framework that we agreed to. Uh, we had the Māori plan, which showed our aspirations across the um, across the Māori values and the um, sectors of social, cultural, economic, and environment really clearly set out. So that no matter how or far we went to try and herd cats, we always had these two terms of reference, the Māori Plan and the Treaty Audit, that helped steer um, uh, our relationship back on track. And so the key part to these two documents was to ensure that the Council was not engaging with the Board, that it was actually engaging with the 19 mana whenua groups and the many Mātawaka organisations in Tāmaki Makaurau. And that's where their first uh, responsibility was to, uh, it was actually to, not to the board, but to um, the Mana Whenua tribes and the, um, and, and the Matawaka organisations. But we were the watchdog, and somebody has called me that said that I'm the CEO of the Māori Ombudsman Auckland organisation, um, that we're like the, um, we're the equivalent to Māori Audit New Zealand or Māori Audit Auckland. And yes, that's what we are. And by having us as the watchdog, uh, it ensures that when the council of 10,000 people starts going in 10,000 different ways, we can pull them back to the treaty audit, the legislative framework and the Māori plan to strengthen our partnership. And when I look at um, what's happening around the country, I can see that the work of the board has really um, accelerated partnership with um, uh, Māori and, um, and the council uh, in this store here because uh, you know, I'm convinced that uh, we've put those key instruments in place to help support the partnership thrive. And I'm really optimistic about Auckland, as much as the 19 Mana Whenua tribes are really, but you know, they have a lot of tension amongst each other, that will pass. Um, we know that when our great grandchildren come along, that um, there's probably likely to be quite a few collaborations around this store here that will benefit us all and we'll be so proud of them. They'll be winning international awards and the like. Uh, and they'll be providing great solutions into this into this region. We are very um, we are very um, confident about um, what our future looks like. So I'd like to think my personal opinion is that uh, that we work really well. Um, the board works really well to make sure that there's that great interface. And also too, there's a lot to be said about the individuals. So when I think of Len Brown and his understanding of um, uh, of the tribes in the in the store here, that was very helpful. Mm -hmm. um, he wasn't scared to um, have meetings with Māori. He didn't. Um, he didn't behave in, in inappropriate ways, as I've seen some mayors around this country. And he wasn't out on social media, um, putting down things Māori. So we had um, we had a really good relationship, and so do the Manapenua tribes with um, you know, Mayor Brown. And the same has happened with Mayor Goff. And um, and also to uh, you know, I really give high praise to David Taipati, our chairman, who who is a uh, his his, um, his his motto was was to me um, as far as educating me or mentoring me was uh, trap him, kill him, skin him. So that was um, no matter what I was doing every day. If I could see that I was doing that, then I was on track to where he he needed me to be behaving as a CEO. And and although it didn't win me many friends, um, I can see why he had that really steadfast way. And he shared that uh, with the council is that that was his style. So he's very courageous. And his courage has made me very courageous, and the board very courageous. So, um, so yeah, there's not just one one thing that makes things work well. There are many things and many people. I I, I haven't heard any Ewe or Hapu actually raise their hand to say this is a great model. Um, so, I'm reluctant to talk about you know any particular examples. Mm -hmm. um, Probably some time ago, though, I did hear from uh, the experiences of um, the Orake Act and the uh, Joint Management Committee on Ranga, uh, Whenua Rangatira, mm -hmm. where um, Ngāti Bata Orake had the deciding vote. And um, so the, within those arrangements, I've been told that they've never had to use their deciding vote, that they've always made consensus decisions around that. It's not the best model in terms of 
because that is their whenua anyway, so they shouldn't perhaps have to be in the joint committee with council representatives, but models like that um, seem to uh, do, do better than what we have as, as other alternative op options. Um, some of the other um, options that have been talked about are the three house model, tikanga um, Māori house, and the tikanga Pākehā house, and then the treaty uh, house in the middle, where the decisions are made there. Uh, there's also the um, proposed model of 50-50 uh, um, partnership. Um, there was a model that uh, has been talked about by many, but also uh, through Ihi, who campaigned on the uh, uh, Māori representative seat in uh, Tāmaki, Makoto. Um, and then uh, I guess there would be a lot more work that being done in terms of academic uh, research that would have other models, but something that is befitting of a treaty relationship for that particular iwi or hapu. I think what's most significant about uh, local government is that it is really at that hapu level, mm. and that is where the, that's, uh, all, that's who signed the treaty. It wasn't iwi, it was hapu. Mm -hmm. And so to, to be able to reflect what was really in the um, titiriti or waitangi as Maria and, and what we've tried to express here today is it's about the justice or about treaty justice um, and being able to give effect to those uh, obligations and those promises that were made so um, I think it's part of what Māori can contribute is that your word is your mana and um, this is uh, mana that has been denied for quite some time so um, I'll just add, um, I think, as the other two have, have said, that you know there are always specific challenges in particular places. So pointing to a particular model as the best model um, is going to be fraught. However, I do uh, agree, and it's not just because she's here, but because, with Brandy, that the Independent Māori Statutory Board has really set up a framework which has had flow-on effects um, certainly down as far as Rotorua um, and, and in terms of having this idea of having the Māori audit um, and a Māori plan and that kind of check and balance um, on the council. I guess the other part of this um, that I think is important is having champions, um, supporters, non-Māori supporters of Māori rights and there Stevie Chadwick in Rotorua and Andrew Judd um, who was in New Plymouth, um, mm. you know, I think have really uh, helped shift some of the conversation um, along uh, seeing non-Māori supporting uh, Māori rights I think is important for Pākehā to see as well as for Māori to see and so I think that's been that's been really helpful in trying to create cultural change um, within um, local government and within New Zealand. Mm. Mm. Any final words before we start looking at um what questions people have, if I can figure out how to do that. <laughs> so the, probably, probably just to yeah, re, 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 reiterate what Maria said, and I agree, you know, the, the biggest supporters we've had of the board have actually been on Māori. Mm -hmm. And I um, you know, big ups to the many, um, thank God Auckland is multicultural, because you know, when I think of um, those from Asia and China and South Africa that have come to the board, that work with the council, that talk about um, you know, what they've seen in their own countries and what they experience here and their regard for things Māori, it's definitely uplifting. And um, you know, I never ever underestimate where our um, where the champions are for things Māori. And uh, be fair to say there's been just as many non-Māori as Māori yeah. for the way that we're um, for the things that we're trying to do here. So yeah, mm -hmm. it's wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I also realise now that, of course, there's people in this room who um, have not got a little chat function in front of them. So maybe, is there anybody in this, while I try to work out how to find the questions on chat, is there somebody here who has got a question that we could start off with? You might have to come and hover around the microphone somewhere. Yeah, I think I question. Sorry? I, I know I'll go and do that. But is there anyone here that wants to 
Can I? I'll, I'll yes, ask. Sir? Um, because, Brandy, you've said a lot about education and tertiary education, and um, I really want to respond to that. I work at the Faculty of Education Social Work, and it's something that we're very aware of and trying to work with. And um, you talked about decolonisation. One of the things I've, we've talked a lot about is trying to decolonise some of the structures and systems that we have. And sometimes it's really hard to know, you know, how to how to begin even. Well, um, just quite simply, just in my opinion, just take um, you know the learned like Linda Smith, like um, you know Sir Mason Jury. Look at the models that they have created that you know from the institutions that you all revere. And, uh, and I had Housing New Zealand come to me saying that they wanted to use some indigenous model from overseas to do the redevelopment of Grey's Ave. And I'm like going, why would you do that when we have, a, you know, Māori models of um, development that you could easily use here with all the experts? And they were like, oh, yeah, it's a good point. No, that's too hard. Go somewhere, go, I'm going to go back to my American Indian model. So, you know, I think mm -hmm. that, um, um, you know, when I look at the, uh, the amount of work that the Māori academics have done, that, that mm. own, and their use, uh, the things that, that have been used by the rest of the institution just, just touches on, you know, just a, a small amount of the great advice and, um, you know, and, um, and thinking that they've done for you. I'm like going, well, why wouldn't you start there, all the mm. institutions, with what you already had? Mm. Well, we've, we've got some, I mean, we've got Tapuna with... Um, to Koiho, you know, Hoskins, and is leading part of that. So the, the Māori people, the colleagues are working, you know, this is what our aim is, but it's, um, it's sometimes, I think, also perhaps just decolonising the way we think about things. You know, that needs to be sort of done as well. Yeah, it's probably a generational process. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I always think it's taken us generations to get into the situation we're in. It'll probably take us generations to get ourselves out. Uh, um, Please don't take but, generations. Let's try not, yeah, not, <laughs> sorry. That sounds like a real cop out. Sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Um, now, I have a question up there from, sorry, but I'm not really sure who that person is, but this is quite a sort of a um, technical kind of question about, you know, how do we, how to look government, ensure that we're engaging effectively and not over engaging, causing consultation fatigue with Māori? I'll leave Maria to read the pie there, but. Um, Anyone want to say something on that? Oh, the council, local government have been around for a long time. They've been consulting for a long time. There's a lot of information already available. I find when, um, when council get does its round of consultation, there's nothing particularly new. There might be something specific to that particular, if it's to do with a particular uh, land-based issue. Um, but I, I really believe that council need to take an audit of the information that they have. Yes. You've got the Māori plan, it's, it's, there's a lot of information there. It probably needs to be organised um, you mm. know, to, to, so that it's access, accessible, especially depending on how many um, staff there are and who's coming and going. But uh, I think it's to, for local government, in terms of decolonisation, there are two main issues. There's the return of land mm -hmm. and uh, the reclamation of um, hapu authority. Mm -hmm. So if we can keep those, if we can't remember anything else, well, how does your policy or the decisions that you're making Give effect to those two headliners. Yeah. So it's, inter it's interesting in a way because it's like you know people get fatigued because it's not getting mm. anywhere. Yeah. So if, and the whole idea of consultation is kind of indicative of that in a way, isn't it? Because it doesn't necessarily get acted upon, right? If I could get acted upon, so that's what creates the fatigue. Is mm. that um, we are now almost become scared not to be consulted on because um, we know that if um, if our voice is not heard again for the thousandth time, mm -hmm. that it would run off and it's going to take us another decade mm -hmm. or a generation to undo. So mm -hmm. um, I, I guess we've um, we're, I feel like we're sort of stuck in the in the swamp with the um, consultation. Um, the the Mana Whenua leaders here say that they have thirty three meetings a month across the central mm -hmm. local government. I'm like going, who out of these tribes 
have got anyone that can attend 33 key mm -hmm. meetings. That's a meeting a day or more. Um, you know, it's just ridiculous. So yeah, please go back to the source documents you already have in your organisations. Um, if your partnership with Māori is, um, you know, is strong, then surely your consultation is going to be less over the years uh, is because you're relying on your everyday partnership uh, with it. Māori um, to have a um, to be able to to understand uh, what our you know, what we think and how we would like to see things done. Mm. Mm. Um, we might move to this question here, which I haven't read in advance, but never mind. For Maria. When for, Maria. It, for Maria, yeah, we'll start with Maria. When are you, when you were talking about treaty obligations and responsibilities. <coughs> Where does here Whakaputanga, Te Tiriti and Undrip fit into this? Also, if in Aurohi the Marae and Hapu are the local authorities, how do they fit into Iwi relationships with local council? Oh, okay. Go Maria. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you uh, for the question. Um, uh, I'm staring intently at the screen to just um, try and reread it. In terms of he whakaputanga, te tiriti, undrip, um, yes, well, I mean, the Crown has those obligations as well. Um, the tribunal's given some steer on where he whakaputanga fits within our kind of um, constitutional framework, but... I think the Crown's yet to fully accept um, what that sort of means. Um, when John Key was Prime Minister, of course, he um, basically rejected um, Te Paparahi o Te Raki Part 1 when they said Māori in the North didn't cede sovereignty and pointed to the declaration. Um, so that's a bit complicated, I think, in terms of what the, where the Crown is at sort of accepting where that might fit. Um, in terms of UNDRIP, um, yes, we have rights um, under international law as Indigenous peoples. Um, I think there's still some debate and um, Clear Charters, I know, says use it or lose it, um, but Hapu and Iwi should be talking about the UNDRIP on every kind of occasion that they can, in plan, whether they're environmental management plans, lodging those with council, where, wherever we are, to try and reinforce our rights under international law and bring those into our domestic setting. I think we still do need um, some kind of legislation which brings the declaration and, and the rights that we have from international law into our um, domestic law setting um, so that it's a bit clearer for the government where they should, should take that. Of course, because it's international law, they should be putting it into practice right now. Um, however, you know, really they are remiss. We can see the um, Y262 report, Kwa Aotearoa Tēne, is still being considered uh, by the government, what, seven years or so on um, from it coming out. So that's, um, you know, something they should get started on. Um, in terms of in our rohe, the marae and hapu are the local authorities. Um, I'm not quite sure... Um, I are you meaning, I'm not sure if, is that question meaning there's some tension between the marae hapu and the iwi body? Um, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure where that's, what you're meaning there. Mm -hmm. Well, if I just, um, the way that I'm reading it is there might be a little bit of tension, but um, if, if there are, uh, then, because um, we have calls from marae people, from hapu people and from iwi, and uh, my, first, um, my first response to them is, please, please go and... Um, uh, Manaki each other to have at least one view. There might be many ways to do things, but at least not be contradicting each other to what you're saying in the local count to the local council. So um, I usually try to push that um, those type of questions, and we do get that question often. Um, go back and have a court it all amongst yourselves to get a common commonly shared view. Mm -hmm. um, if you can't do that, um, all marae and hapu have the same right as every New Zealander to submit to any process of the council. And I personally would like to see more marae and more hapu really strongly using that instrument to have their whakaaro come forward. Mm -hmm. um, uh, as I said, in, in the hope that it's not going to contradict what your own iwi is saying. So that's my answer to that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have you got something you want to no, add there? I... 
Do, the question. Do, right. do, do you want to, does anybody want to address the question which is really getting beyond local government, which is, are we ready for a Māori upper house? It seems to, I think, is the only other question we had there, and we're getting close to time, so. Um, it just, it's pretty much. Um, can you? There's no point having an upper house um, discussion without a broader discussion about constitutional change first. Um, the, the upper house would have to, have to fit somewhere, um, and I think we need to um, look first of all at our current constitutional arrangements um, and maybe have a better audit of central government, treaty audit of central government, and a body that's well resourced to conduct that audit um, before we could think about an upper house. My two cents. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. Hey, um, I just wanted to just add to that that given that we are now the minority, we're once the majority, does that give us leeway into considering having an upper house for Māori and who would be the representatives? Can you identify yourself, please? Oh, yes, of course. Sorry, my name is Warren. I'm a part of the EcoSci chat group, um, social. Yep. So that's basically my question uh, in regards to if we are now, given that we are the minority, will there be a leeway into looking at setting up an upper house and how will that affect the restrictions on the lower house in terms of our tikanga? What, what will be the restrictions given that um, the lower house will always have the final say? I think it's really... Oh, sorry. Maria, but you're going to go on there. Oh no, I was just I was just going to say I, I think we still need the broader discussion about constitutional change first before you start getting sort of very specific about whether an upper house is the appropriate model or not. Yeah, yeah. I point taken. I, I just want to say that though, by having that there in place, will that then give them the voice and more chairs to allow a broader view or opinion regarding Tikanga and how that be restricted in the lower house? I mean, are we always going to be under the crown or what will that mean that now that we are the majority, we've lost the majority, we're now the minority, will there be leeway into us having a Kia ora, Warren. I think um, this is such a huge question you've raised and a little bit beyond the kind of original co-papa for this talk. Yes, no point taken. I yeah, just um, is a, a, a yeah, 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 and um, we. I think it, it sounds like something we should be. Oh, actually, well, let's face it. There's been plenty of constitutional conversations of various mm. sorts, and we need a lot more of those, and then some kind of action to follow from that. But um, uh, something for a much longer conversation. Yeah, Kate, I understand. Hey, thanks for everything. You're doing a good job. Cheers. Thank you. For, thank you for participating. Um, and thank you everybody who has uh, participated today in this room here and all around. Um, te motu, and I'm sorry that there's not a much longer time period so that we could have a lot more of a, a conversation between everybody, but I hope, but I know some of you are sitting together in rooms somewhere else and you can carry on the conversation there as we may do here. Um, and I'd really like especially to thank our three wonderful speakers who have, have given this time and shared a lot of, I don't know, I'd hate to think how many years of wisdom as, um, mm. you know, you, you three embody between you in terms of dealing with some of these issues. <laughs> 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 I'm the oldest. <laughs> 170 now, time three. <laughs> so, thanks, me to the given to those that have, um, you know, continued to, as you said, we've been resilient and there have been many um, Māori leaders that have, have left a lot of, uh, I guess, um, information or really set the path for where we need to be. Um, we're not there yet, but there's a, there are many people that have contributed to this space yeah. um, along the way and we have some still that are with us today, um, but many that have passed away. So, and I'm talking Māori and non-Māori, um, and that we need to just continue as we, you know, focusing on what we started off with today, and that is around the treaty and really giving effect to that at this local level, and um, in particular to Hapu.
So Māori representation, we really need to think about what the treaty says and in particular around the role of hapu within the own Aungorge and how that might look. Mm -hmm. Probably finally for me, um, you know, anyone can take our statute and just take the word statute out of it and, you know, look to the council to support the words in it. In it. Uh, you don't need to be waiting like we did for an act of um, parliament um, to make change in the local government. It's just a quite, it's a really easy piece of legislation to read and write. And, um, you know, it's, um, it needs uh, advocacy from us all uh, to get councils to really consider uh, the opportunities with um, the framework. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, oh, well, just I was just going to say, just finally from me, thank you to everybody for participating and listening um, and for the questions. And for those of you that are in areas where there's a vote, um, whether to have uh, Māori constituencies or not, Māori wards or not, please go out and uh, vote for them. Um, that's all from me. Kia ora. Kia Important final message. Mm. Uh, finish for the... uh, yeah, also, I would, would really like to do, we need the Pākehā end and the Māori end. So the Pākehā end really is to um, ask everybody to please join me in, in thanking after mm. And uh, I'll, I've got the um, privilege of finishing uh, our session in the way that we started. So, kia ora everyone for bringing us together. Yes, and um, kia ora everyone who's participated in today's session. Uh, nō reira, ka mutu tā tātou kōrero, um, ka inoi tātou, kia tō, kia tātou kato, kia tō whai o tō tātou reki a iwi Thank you.